All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The United States Court of Appeals for the 15th Circuit is now in session. All you having business in this honorable court, come forth and you shall be heard. God save the United States and this honorable court. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> The court convenes today to hear argument in the case of Williams versus the City of Springfield et al. We'll first hear from the appellants. Who will speak first? Ms. Gill, please step forward. May it please the court. Good afternoon, my name is Jessica Gill, and along with Lawrence Rowland, we represent the appellant, Mr. Chet Williams. At this point, I would like to respectfully reserve two minutes for our rebuttal time. So reserved. Thank you. I would also like to thank the court for the opportunity to represent our client's interests today. This case is about the right of a private citizen, Mr. Chet Williams, expressing his deep concerns that policies of the Springfield Fire Department affect firefighters' ability to save lives in the community of Springfield. We respectfully pray this court, under de novo review, reverse the district court's holding that there was no Fourth Amendment violation. Uh, affirm the district court's finding that there was a First Amendment violation. Additionally, we ask this court to uphold, uphold the $10,000 damages award, as well as uphold the awarding of our client's attorney's fees. The Fourth Amendment of the United States of America protects citizens from unreasonable searches and seizures. In United States v. Jacobson, the court determined that there was a search when a legitimate expectation of privacy was infringed. The Fourth Circuit in United States v. Simons determined that a legitimate expectation of privacy exists when you have one, a subjective expectation of privacy, and two, you have an objective expectation of privacy that society is willing to accept as reasonable. In the case at hand today, the record clearly states on pages 31 and 32 that Chet Williams had a subjective expectation of privacy. He subjectively believed that his Facebook notes were private. Therefore, today I will focus on the second part of the test stated in Simons, which is whether or not that expectation of privacy is objectively reasonable. The Supreme Court in O'Connor v. Ortega found that purses, luggage, and briefcase maintain an expectation of privacy in the contents of those items despite their presence in the workplace. Focusing on a briefcase. Counselor, how does it, can you distinguish that though from in this instance, I believe that this was a computer that was owned by the city. How can you have an expectation of privacy in that? Yes, Your Honor. In this instance, it was a city owned computer. If we use the example found in O'Connor v. Ortega, and we have a work issued briefcase, which clearly relates to the employment context, it contains work files clearly within the work context, not personal property but yet it contains a wallet, that wallet maintains its personal private privacy expectations. In the case at hand, yes, we do have a work issue computer that does contain work files, obviously within the employment context, but we also have a personal Facebook, and that personal Facebook on its face looks personal, it has a privacy uh, setting so that it's password protected, it requires a login, Therefore, we can use this example in O'Connor v. Ortega to extend the analogy to the case at hand today. Thank you. Using that example, we can also use the computer policy to determine that Chet Williams had an objective expectation of, of privacy. If you turn to page 17 of the record, section 5 of the applicable computer use policy clearly states that in cases where explicit authorization has been granted by management to remedy or investigate a prohibited use, city, city personnel may do such an investigation. However, if you turn to page 16 of the record under section two of the, of the applicable computer, computer use policy, 
there are three prohibited uses listed. Those three prohibited uses are discriminatory or harassing use, obscene, sexually explicit, or pornographic use, and any use in violation of licensing governing, of any license governing the use of the software. It is clear that the record indicates none of those three prohibited uses are at issue today. Therefore, the appellees cannot say that the search that was conducted was under the computer use policy. If the appellees would like to make the argument that instead section three of the computer use policy is what gave notice to the appellant, Mr. Chet William, a closer reading of that computer use policy indicates that that policy does not cover the search that was performed. Section three of the computer use policy states, limited, occasional, or incidental use of city resources, sending or receiving, for personal non-business purposes is understandable and acceptable. However, all such use should be done in a manner that does not negatively affect the city or the applicable department's ability to serve the public. By posting the Facebook notes via his work computer, Chet Williams in no way negatively affected the city's or the applicable department's ability to serve the public. The appellees may make the argument that by posting the notes, there was unrest and there was disharmony within the department. However, the actual act of posting those notes, clicking a single button on the computer screen, did not in any way negatively affect the department's ability to serve the public. Well, is, that the, is that the test, the pushing of a button, or is the, what was said in the result in the firehouse? The computer use policy that was applicable at the time does not account for any attenuated effects. It clearly states that negatively affects the city's or the applicable department's to serve the public, and it was the use. The use of the computer itself did not negatively affect the department's ability. The result of the uh, use may have in some way affected the department's ability, ability to serve the public, but that is not what the computer use policy covers as stated in section three. In O'Connor v. Ortega, the Supreme Court said that there's no talesman to determine in, in all instances which privacy expectations are reasonable in all cases. Today, we will use Leventhal v. Napec to determine that our client, Mr. Chet Williams, did in fact have an objectionable uh, expectation of privacy. Leventhal v. Napec lays out a test to establish objectionable uh, privacy. The first step is, did the employee have a private office with a door? It is clear in this case that Chet Williams had a private office with a door. In fact, when the search itself was performed, the door was closed. The second step of the test is whether or not the employee had exclusive use of his office and the computer. Chet Williams had exclusive use of his computer. No one else shared the computer with him. It was not a common workstation that multiple employees used. Ms. Gill, if I can interrupt, you're talking about the door to the room being closed, and then you're shifting to the computer and whether or not there's this expectation of privacy. Mm -hmm. which, which should we focus on as a court? The room, the computer, or the Facebook program, and why? Your Honor, the focus today is the Facebook notes. I mention only the door and I mention only the computer because those are the steps that the court in Lemonthal v. Napec took to establish a objectionable uh, expectation of privacy in the contents of the computer. In this case, the contents of the computer would be the Facebook notes. But wasn't that driven by the policy or the lack of policy in Leventhal, though? In Leventhal, if you actually get a little bit further down into this test, it says, yes, there was a computer use policy, which 100% banned personal use. Notwithstanding that policy, however, the court found that there was a legitimate expectation of privacy because that computer use policy was irregularly and infrequently uh, applied to the computers in the case. And additionally, uh, any people, IT technicians mostly, who did have access to computers under that, uh, under that policy in Leventhal only did so for maintenance purposes. In the case at hand here, we can see clearly that we have the same facts. Page 37 of the record indicates under Kenneth Westfall's testimony that there were other instances in which the computer use policy should have been enforced but was not. That indicates that the computer use policy at hand was infrequently and irregularly enforced. 
Additionally, the computer use policy on page 17 under section 4 says that logs may be gathered for the following purposes, cost analysis, resource allocation, optimal technical management and of information resources, and detecting patterns of use that indicate employees are violating city policies. That does not say that it was monitoring. It does not say that it was regular monitoring. There is no notice in this case that the appellant could have received that this policy was monitoring his Facebook use. Further, this case presents a public policy argument. How can we say that as long as the appellant clicks log out of his Facebook at any point during the day, his privacy expectations are maintained, but when he removes himself from his office, closes the door behind him for two minutes, for one minute, for 30 seconds, that his privacy expectations vanish. The record does not indicate how long Mr. Williams was away from his office and how long it took Cliff Gordon to search the Facebook notes and print them off. But as a public policy argument, this is just not uh, reasonable. If we can say that for a certain amount of period, your expectations exist, 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 and then for a, a small window, there is no expectation, and then you click log out, and all of a sudden, they reappear. That is to say that only during times when the perfect conditions exist, when you happen to leave your Facebook open in your private office with a closed door, when your employee happens to see you leave, actually is staking out your office, hoping you leave, hoping that you are leaving your Facebook logged in on your computer, that you have no expectation of privacy. But if those exact conditions do not exist, that your privacy expectations, your legitimate expectation of privacy remains intact. Ms. Gill, you've got two notes here. Mm -hmm. One was published, one's a draft. What difference does that make in your analysis? Your Honor, there is no difference in the published or the unpublished notes. Both of the notes were the product of the same search. They were both obtained at the same time. Additionally, the district court considers both notes as one product, and therefore, on appeal, we consider both notes as one product as well. So how does the standard of review, the de novo review, impact what we should be doing as we look at the question today? Under de novo review, we ask that you review questions of law, which is whether or not on a case-by-case -case basis, as stated in O'Connor v. Ortega, this particular case with these set of facts, which have been established by the district court and which are under clearly erroneous air as a standard of review, if those facts as an aggregate prove that there is a legitimate expectation of privacy, namely there being subjective expectation of privacy and an objective expectation of privacy that society deems as reasonable. Do, does that equation equal the legitimate expectation of privacy? Therefore, for the foregoing reasons, we request that this court, under a de novo, de novo review, find that the district court erred, that there was a search, and that there was a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rowland. Please may it, Sorry, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Lawrence Rowland, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to represent Mr. Chet Williams' First Amendment interests today before the United States Court of Appeals for the 15th Circuit. We respectfully pray that this court, under de novo review, affirm the district court's finding that Mr. Chet Williams' First Amendment rights have been violated by the appellees. We further pray that this court affirm and uphold the $10,000 damages award granted by the district court and uphold the awarding of the attorney's, uh, so the attorney's fees of Mr. Chet Williams pursuant to the uh, discretion given to the courts by 42 U.S.C. 1988. The First Amendment clearly states that Congress shall make no law that abridges the freedom of speech. Public employers, specifically the appellees in today's case, cannot condition public employment on a basis that infringes an employee's rights as defined by the First Amendment. 
That comes to us from the United States Supreme Court in Connick v. Myers. The United States Supreme Court further in Pickering versus the Board of Education explains that there needs to be a balance of interest between that of the employee and that of the employer working together. But before you get to the Pickering, don't you have to, our first issue is whether it's a public concern, isn't it? Yes, Your Honor. Before we actually do get to the balancing, uh, there's a three-part inquiry uh, that Daniels v. Quinn tells us that we need to engage in. The first part of that three-part inquiry is, does the speech actually touch upon matters of public concern? Second, was the punishment that was experienced by the employee, was that because of that speech? And if you have a yes to numbers one and two, then you do the pickering conic balance test. Well, what, what, do you, what do we have here? Don't we have in Exhibit A some that might be characterized as public and some content that wouldn't, wouldn't be? Yes, Your Honor. Both the Exhibit A and Exhibit B have a different level of whether they be uh, matters that touch upon public concern or matters that address a private concern. Uh, the First Amendment claims between employees and employers actually fall on a spectrum where you have 100% private on one end, 100% public on the other end, and the court decides somewhere in the middle where that interest lies. We would hope that you would find that the speech was 100% public, but that's not necessarily realistic. Once you figure out, once the court determines where on that spectrum the speech lies, then you run the items through the six factors of the pickering conic balance test. But even before we get to the pickering conic balance test, we ask, does this speech touch upon matters of public concern? We need to look at the content, the form, and the context of the speech. But For, when you're looking at the context and the form, you, you look at when he posted it, Williams posted it, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Well, he was angry at that time, and he was, had been in a fight, and he was, in effect, uh, uh, not getting along with the chief, is that correct? It, that is, as the record indicates, the condition so of So how, how does that weigh against for you or against you? That actually weighs in our favor, Your Honor. The Eighth Circuit in Casey versus the city of Kabul states criticisms, no matter how offensive or obnoxious, of government officials and their policies clearly address matters of public concern. The specifics requirements in this formulaic analysis of a First Amendment claim requires both criticisms of the employer and their policies. If Chet Williams had just spoken about how much he couldn't stand Fire Chief Swanson and did not address the policies of Appellee Swanson, specifically the removing of the religious open door policy, the removal of retirement benefits, if all he had done was carping criticisms of Appellee Swanson, then there is no First Amendment claim that Mr. Williams can make. However, because we follow exactly what Casey versus the City of Kabul says, we have criticisms, no matter how obnoxious or offensive, of a public employer and his policies. This is matters that touch upon, sorry, this is speech that touches upon matters of public concern. Once I've taken care of speech that touches upon matters of public concern, I get to go to the Pickering Conic Balance Test. The Pickering Conic Balance Test has six factors. First, harmony in the workplace. Second, was the, the, the potential for the deterioration of close working relationships necessary for that employer to succeed in providing the services as required by their existence? Third, we need to look at the time, place, and manner of the speech to determine, again, whose interests weigh, that of the employer or that of the employer. Fourth, we need to look at the context in which the dispute arose. Fifth, we need to look at the actual level that the public has uh, the level of interest that they have in that speech that's in question. And the last factor of the Pickering County Balance Test is we need to see, did the employee's ability to perform his or her job, was that actually affected by that speech? When you look at content, form, and context of the present record, we know that Mr. Williams was fired because of his speech. The record on page 72 tells us that. The parties have agreed to that. When we look at the six factors, starting first with the harmony that existed or didn't exist, inside of the office. The record clearly indicates that there were problems inside of the Springfield Fire Department caused by Apelli Swanson's policies prior to the posting of the Facebook note. Because this disharmony already existed inside of the office, a police cannot claim that the first element of the pickering conic balance test weighs in their favor. Moving to the second let, element. Let me, let me just save you some yes, time. Why don't you go to the weakest of the six factors for your client in Pickering. Yes, Your Honor. Tell us why that shouldn't dominate. That would be the sixth factor. And that would be the, did the employee's ability to perform his job actually be affected by his speech? 
we've never had the opportunity to see if that's possible. Because there's only three days worth of existence from the publishing of the note to the discovery of the note and the firing by the appellees. From all indications, the record shows appellee Swanson was very happy with the job that Chet Williams did on a daily basis, both as a firefighter and as the deputy fire chief with his PR communication responsibilities. That does not appear to have been impeded in those three days. But the appellee will argue that it has an adverse effect on, on, their, on the purpose of fighting fires and government uh, purposes. Yes, Your Honor. And specifically, we would reference Janusitis versus the Middle, Middlebury Volunteer Fire Department, which explains that the only way a fire department or a firefighter in a fire department setting can actually claim that, I apologize, the only way that the, the fire department, in this case the appellees, can claim that that kind of speech affected the ability, the esprit de corps, as the court in Janusitis stated, was constant carping criticisms, months in the making, that clearly undermined the fire chief's ability to run an efficient fire department. That's not the case that we have here today. We have a note, one single note that was published to a limited audience that did not, and has not as the record indicates, bring up a, a carping criticism standard as, as Janusitis' court implicates as, is required before you can say that this kind of speech leads to these kind of effects and those kind of effects destroy the esprit de corps. When we talk about the, the, the form that the actual speech took, we have a, even if the court would like to consider it a private conversation, uh, there are multiple cases, three specifically, Cox versus Dardanelle, uh, Belk versus the city of Eldon, and I apologize, I cannot remember the third, that says that a private forum, speech that touches upon matters of public concern, in a private forum, does not lose First Amendment protections. So if the appellees want to claim, or if this court wants to believe that because every citizen in Springfield didn't receive notice of these Facebook notes, then the form fails, or that it's not speech that touches upon matters of public concern, that is not the case. Cox v. Darnell and Belk versus the city of Eldon tell us that a private setting, let's say the private setting is Chet Williams speaking just with four or five friends on Facebook, several of which are citizens of Springfield. We know that because the record on page 56 indicates that they emailed Fire Chief Swanson asking if they would be able to, to do their job. Again, the disharmony that existed inside of the office, sorry, the Springfield Fire Department office, was discord that was created by the appellee's policies. The fact that Mr. Chet Williams decided to engage in that public debate, let the public know that these policies were affecting the Springfield Fire Department, points to the content and the context being important. Once again, affirming that this is speech that touches upon matters of public concern. What, what is there in the record that shows that the operation of the fire department was impacted by these, these statements, these notes? Fire Chief Swanson, I believe it is on pages uh, 54 through 55, begins to explain the importance of uh, religion and firefighting uh, and the safety of the citizens of Springfield. But then what he does is he adds a little caveat that says that what he was hearing were um, whispers from the men. Uh, they were complaining a little bit more. They were resisting his direction in his personal opinion. So how did that affect firefighting? Your Honor, it, it, what, what, I, what, what Mr. Chet Williams would say is all it really was doing was beginning the conversation that says that there are policies that have been implemented by the appellees that have the ability to deteriorate the close working relationships that can exist because of the appellee's policies. Not the fact that the public was made aware of these policies, that's all the Facebook note does. It's the actual policies themselves that will lead to the deterioration of the close working relationships. But personal grievances or disputes are not public concern. Isn't that correct? Correct. And again, Your Honor, if Chet Williams had literally just said, I cannot stand Fire Chief Swanson, that's it let's get him out, then we have no legs to stand on for a First Amendment claim. But that's not what Chet Williams said. He said, I have a problem with Appelli Swanson because of these specific policies and what they have done to the, the fabric of the Springfield Fire Department. And because of that, because they are criticisms of the public employer and his policies, as required by Casey versus the city of Kabul, they are speech that touches upon matters of public concern. That lets us get to the pickering conic balance test. That balance test specifically factors one, two, four, and five weigh heavily in Chet Williams' favor. And as I discussed, um, option number six, we actually cannot tell one way or the other if it affects 
Chet Williams' ability to do his job because he only had three days since the publishing of the note until he was fired. Because the content, form, and context of the speech touches upon matters of public concern, because it's criticism of a public official and his policies, it touches its speech that touches upon matters of public concern. Once we have speech that touches upon matters of public concern, we run through the pickering conic balance test. The pickering conic balance tests, harmony in the workplace, the potential deterioration of close working relationships, the actual level of the public's interest in that speech are all factors that weigh heavily in Chet Williams' favor when we do that balancing analysis. For those reasons, we pray that this court, under de novo, uh, de novo review, affirm the district court's finding that Chet Williams' First Amendment rights have been violated, uphold the $10,000 damages award that was granted by the district court, and uphold the awarding of Mr. Williams' attorney's fees as allowed by 42 U.S.C. 1988. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Appley, who will speak first. Please, Mr. Mullen. May it please the court. Grant Mullen, co-counsel for the Appley. This is my co-counsel, John Matson. I'll be addressing the Fourth Amendment issue this afternoon. My co-counsel will be addressing the First Amendment issue. This case is about the district court's proper ruling that a person cannot reasonably expect a Facebook note to remain private when he stands up from a computer that he does not own and walks away from it without logging out. It seems like a simple question, but it does touch upon very important concerns. I'd like to first address three factual points in addition to those uh, addressed by opposing counsel that might help us clarify this particular issue. First, Appellant was not a normal firefighter at the Springfield Fire Department. He was second in command. Pursuant to his duties as Deputy Fire Chief, he was in charge of communicating with the public. He was the communications liaison. In his words, the spokesperson. When people saw his face, they saw the face of the Springfield Fire Department. When they read his writings, they read official communications of the Springfield Fire Department. Second, the computer policy does permit personal use. However, personal use only to the extent that it does not negatively interfere with the Springfield Fire Department's ability to serve the public. And third, the policy does not permit uh, in, an investigation concerning uh, after a violation has occurred. Instead, it permits an investigation to determine whether a violation has occurred. This particular fact is important in light of the district court's finding that uh, appellant should have been on notice that his computer could be reviewed at any time in the words of the policy, at the employer's own discretion. That, that's a factual finding that we have to give deference to? That's a finding of law, Your Honor, and uh, under this current standard of review, that would be reviewed de novo. Well, which part of the policy are you looking at, Mr. Mullen? Your Honor, in reference uh, to the, my second factual point, that would be section three of the policy. Uh, in reference to my third factual point, uh, that would be in reference to section four of the policy and section five of the policy. If you'd like, I can turn to the record and point you to the exact language. Please proceed. Section three of the policy states um, the third line from the bottom, uh, all such use should be done in a manner that does not negatively affect the city's or the applicable department's ability to serve the public. Section four of the policy states in uh, paragraph B, if you'll turn on page 17, states the city reserves the right at its discretion to review any files stored on city resources, including documents, website logs, and email messages to the extent necessary to ensure city resources are being used in compliance with the law in this policy. Is that what happened here? Excuse me, Your Honor? Is that what happened here? There, there is an argument that uh, this particular information was not stored on city resources. However, that argument frankly misunderstands uh, the way a computer interacts with the internet. When a computer views information, views information from the internet, it puts that information on its random access memory, or RAM. So in a sense, although I will grant that this particular information was not stored permanently on a hard drive, when a computer accesses the, uh, the internet, it will temporarily store much of the content displayed on a particular page in a uh, computer's RAM, or random access memory. Thus, uh, under this particular policy, under this policy, uh, review of the computer was permitted. I will, I will grant you, Your Honor, it's not clear from the record how much actual information displayed 
how much actual information on this particular RAM was uh, stored from the, uh, from the access of the Facebook site. However, uh, it, it is true that certainly much of this information could have been temporarily stored on the computer's random access memory. Uh, your honors have likely encountered this particular phenomenon. When you uh, access a web browser, it will often display the contents of a web page um, uh, without being connected to the internet. And the back and forward browsers will also work, will also function as well without connection to the internet. Thus, uh, our job here is to determine privacy expectations under the Fourth Amendment. We turn then to the lodestar for determining privacy expectations under the Fourth Amendment, Katz versus the United States. Under the holding in Katz, we determine first whether a person has a subjective expectation of privacy, and second, whether that subjective expectation of privacy is one that society as a whole is prepared to accept as objectively reasonable. We first address the first prong of these of the uh, Katz test, whether appellant has, in the words of Katz, exhibited, a man of, exhibited an expectation of privacy. Words or claims to expectations of privacy, as appellant here urges us, are frankly not enough. In the words of Katz, and later in Cirillo, California versus Cirillo, a person cannot uh, merely claim an expectation of privacy, but a person's actions must have exhibited that expectation. In this case, the appellant stood up from his computer and chose not to log out of his Facebook account. He then walked away from that computer. The one action that we can point to in this particular case that manifests a subject, a subject of expectation of privacy is the closing of the door. And I agree that this should be a factor that is weighed. However, this factor also needs to be weighed in light of Appellant's own testimony, and I quote, honestly, I didn't even really care that Gordon, the person who had searched the office, was in my office. Guys go into my office all the time, unquote. But thus, Ms. Skill makes a uh, public policy argument that should an employee that has his own office and a, and a door have to worry every time he gets up to, to go get a cup of coffee to, to log off? Very well, Your Honor. I, I understand Ms. Gill's uh, position on, on, that, uh, on that particular point. I'm unclear uh, as to how that actually implicates the public. It would seem that she wishes to make the argument that, um, that, by, uh, that by running the risk of bringing things in, she wishes the court to protect privacy expectations or, protect, or to, uh, excuse me, to enforce privacy expectations in the context of public employment. However, we get up from our work computers all the time. And I would submit to this court that if you had uh, criticized your, your uh, direct supervisor in uh, such words, we would all be clear that we needed to log out of our of whatever program we were accessing uh, in, order to, uh, in order to keep that particular information private. I guess, from I guess I'm hung up on a, on a private office with a door. It's not a cubicle. Very well, Your Honor. Uh, uh, the groundwork for determining privacy expectations in any given workplace uh, begins with the Supreme Court case of O'Connor versus Ortega. We assess the operational realities of a workplace uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. That's a, that's a mandate from the Supreme Court. Getting to your uh, question, Your Honor, the, uh, in this particular case, the operational realities of this workplace did not indicate that by closing this door, he had exhibited a subjective expectation of privacy. Appellant in this case testified that he, that he encouraged men to enter his office and wanted them to feel welcome there and wanted them, to, uh, wanted them to feel comfortable inside of his office. He maintained an open door policy. Thus it is, and even if it can be said that this particular closing of the door manifests a subjective expectation of privacy, the best that can be said is that this is a weak or poor showing of a subjective expectation of privacy. And that should determine then our second inquiry under the CATS test, whether this particular expectation of privacy is one that society as a whole is prepared to accept as objectively reasonable. Informing our decision should be this poor showing of a subjective expectation of privacy, but in addition, should also be uh, the test uh, laid out in the case of INRAE Asia Global. Uh, there are two tests uh, by federal courts uh, currently circulating um, that address privacy expectations and whether or not they are objectively reasonable. One is the anderson angevine line of cases, which is not as persuasive because it does not address uh, privacy expectations in the electronic sphere where this particular search has occurred. The other is INRE Asia Global. I will use the four factors of INRE Asia Global here to guide uh, the analysis of whether this particular privacy expectation is one that society as a whole is prepared to accept as objectively reasonable. These four factors are as follows. 
as follows. Does the corporation maintain a policy banning personal or other objectionable use? Does the company monitor the use of the employee's computer or email? Third, do third parties have a right of access to the computer or emails? Fourth, did the corporation notify the employee or was the employee aware of the use or monitoring policies? We turn then to the first factor in the in Asia Global Let test. me just ask a question of application Certainly. here. Uh, why should this circuit court, the 15th Circuit Court of Appeals, be guided by this bankruptcy court decision? That's a fair question, Your Honor. Uh, in this particular case, this particular test is persuasive because it does an excellent job of summarizing the previous decisions on point. For example, the 4th, 7th, 6th, and 8th circuits have all found, under similar circumstances, that a person and a computer policy, under a computer policy, that a person did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, this particular test analyzes privacy expectations in the electronic sphere and underneath a computer policy that reduces privacy expectations, as is the case here. The, uh, uh, this particular court, uh, to the extent that it finds persuasive, could also use the anderson angevin uh, test enunciated by the Tenth Circuit. However, uh, that test addresses more, two of, the, two of that test's factor address ownership expectations rather than privacy expectations because it was more concerned with a seizure in the uh, context of public employment rather than uh, privacy expectations. In the Ca context. Counselor, under the yes, factors that you're looking at, would it really make any difference whether he logged out of the computer or not, if it's all driven by the policy? Indeed, Your Honor. Uh, this particular, not logging out of the Facebook account addresses something that the, that the Asia Global Test does not, uh, does not factor into, which we have already looked at today, which is an uh, a exhibition or a manifestation of a subjective expectation of privacy. Uh, thus, we, that needs to inform our decision. Uh, we need to make a threshold inquiry first to determine whether or not a, a subjective expectation of privacy has been manifested before we turn to these four factors to determine whether that expectation is one that society as a whole is prepared to accept as objectively reasonable. We turn then to the first factor. There is a policy that permits personal use, however, have we, as we have already discussed, it permits personal use only to the extent that it does not negatively interfere with the uh, applicable department's ability to serve the public. In this case, uh, Williams' use negatively interfered with the uh, Springfield Fire Department's ability to serve the public because it effused, confused official information with personal grievances. It undermined the supervisor and subordinate relationship between appellant and Chief Swanson, and it incited discontent among his fellow firefighters. Second, thus, excuse me, thus the uh, first factor weighs substantially in favor of the appellees. Second, does the company monitor the use of the employee's computer or email. In this case, this particular policy had only been in effect for one single year. And in that year, it had already been enforced. Uh, appellant's characterizations of this particular enforcement as irregular or um, infrequent are frankly misplaced. Uh, instead, this policy had been enforced and Kenneth Westfall testified, and I quote, the city stated, the city stated and I quote, we will be watching you much closer from now on. Thus, the second factor also weighs substantially in favor of the appellees. The third factor, do third parties have a right of access to the computer or emails? Certainly, every computer, every computer in this particular case had a sticker that stated property of the city of Springfield on it. Furthermore, uh, the city had a right, right to review any file stored on, on any computer that it owned at its own discretion, as evidenced by the policy. Also, Facebook uh, to the, also, Facebook has the right to review information stored on its own secured servers. Let, let me back up there. So you're saying the right to review any file stored, but doesn't the policy put a limitation on that review ability? Uh, and does that really apply in this case? Your Honor, to the extent that this particular limitation applies, uh, that, that may be persuasive, I will grant you. However, even if that limitation applies, appellant should have been on notice that this particular uh, computer is, could have been reviewed and its files could have been reviewed at any time. Should a person reviewing the files stored on a city computer happen to glance upon a, uh, a uh, website account that has not been logged out of, certainly we cannot expect them to avert their eyes or somehow shield what's actually what's actually happening or displayed on the monitor. That would be uh, something we we don't even expect of our police force, much less uh, of our of our fire department. Is this a plain view argument then? 
Your Honor, it's not a plain view argument because what's not clear is whether or not this was displayed on the monitor. However, it is a safe assumption to make that certainly it could have been. Thus, because these three factors that we have discussed thus far and the fourth factor, notice, because he had read the email explaining the policy, it was in the break room, it had only been enforced for a year, because all of these four factors weigh substantially in favor of appellees, we grant that this court, even if it determines a subjective expectation of privacy has been exhibited, that that expectation is not one that society is prepared to accept as reasonable. Thus, we pray that this court affirm the district court's finding of a no reasonable expectation of privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Mr. Mattson. May it please the court. This case is about whether a public employer can terminate an employee who abused the position of authority to push a message focused on personal grievances. The district court erred when it held that Williams' First Amendment rights were violated when he was fired for his speech for three reasons. First, because he was not speaking as a citizen. Second, because he was speaking only indirectly on matters of public concern. And third, because his interest in speaking did not outweigh the city's weighty interest in the efficient operation of a very important public entity, the Springfield Fire Department. These three issues are questions of law reviewed by this court de novo. In order for a public employee to sustain a Section 1983 action for employment retaliation based on speech, all three of those conditions must be met. The public employee must be speaking as a citizen on a matter of public concern, and their interest must outweigh the city's interest in the efficient operation of its services. I will first explain why Williams was not speaking as a citizen. The district court committed error per se when it ignored Supreme Court precedent of Garcetti v. Ceballos, a 2006 decision, and did not analyze whether Williams was speaking as a citizen. In that case, the Supreme Court stated that when a public employee is speaking pursuant to their official job duties, they are not speaking as a citizen for First Amendment purposes, and thus their speech is not insulated from First Amendment protections. Circuit courts have further clarified that when a public employee makes a statement that the circumstances surrounding that speech indicate that the statement is an official statement on behalf of the public employer, then the public employee is making a statement pursuant to their official job duties, and thus does not receive First Amendment protection for their speech. In this case, Williams note, when we look at Exhibits A and B, Williams' speech indicates that he was making a statement pursuant to his official job duties. If we look at the top of the note, it's titled Memorandum. We have abundant testimony on the record that Williams spoke numerous occasions as the Springfield Fire Department communications liaison, as the mouthpiece of the fire department, in memoranda format. So let me interrupt you. So who is he usually speaking to when he does that? To the firefighters of the station, Your Honor. Only them? No, Your Honor. He also is, part of his responsibility is to speak to the public on matters of official Springfield Fire Department business when authorized by the chief, Chief Swanson in this case. So let's take the public context. Here he's out there laboring in Facebook. Yes. Does it make a difference if it's not all of the public? If he's hand-selected the public that he will speak to on the issue? Your Honor, we would direct your attention to both Facebook notes, Exhibits A and B. And if we look at them, he addresses them to us, the men of the station, when he's speaking. And this will inform our understanding of whether this is a matter of public concern. But because his speech was focused to speaking to the firefighters in both notes, this indicates that his intent was to disseminate this message to the firefighters. Additional information on the notes indicates that this was a statement pursuant to his official duties. Also at the top, the message is titled, Changes at the SFD. Kenny Westfall, one of Williams' best friends at the station, testified that the subject matter of many of Williams' official memoranda for the SFD was about changes. But his audience was bigger than the firemen. It was all his friends on Facebook, which would be the public also. That's true, Your Honor. That's very true. And we would hope that this court, and it's not a clear-cut home run case for us on the citizen issue. However, when we look at 
the circumstances as a whole, as indicated by the, the circuit court. So we need to look at the circumstances surrounding the speech. It looks very much like those other messages that he had sent in his official capacity before. Thus, we would urge this court to find a, an additional uh, factual uh, validation for that claim is their signed Deputy Fire Chief Williams. If, he, if his intent was to speak to the uh, community as a whole, it would have, or in his, in his personal uh, citizen, um, a, as a citizen, it, it, it would have been far more li reason, likely to uh, assume that he would have signed them Williams, Chet, Chet Williams, something along those lines. Thus, we encourage this court to, to follow uh, Garcetti v. Ceballos, that Supreme Court precedent, and hold that Williams was not speaking as a citizen for First Amendment purposes. However, even if this court were to determine that Williams was speaking as a citizen, we, ha we still have to assess whether he was speaking on a matter of public concern. And, and what is the case law defining public concern? Um, Your, Your Honor, the um, best case in this, according to our, uh, from our side of the argument, is Connick v. Myers, Supreme Court case, referenced by um, opposing counsel. In that case, Your Honors, a public employee, a district attorney in that case, was upset uh, because she'd been transferred, uh, and, she, and she, didn't like, she didn't like that she had been transferred. Um, so that night she went home and she drafted 13 questions. And the questions, after the Supreme Court looked over them and looked at the, as, as opposing counsel stated, the content, the context, and the form of the speech, as the Supreme Court reviewed those elements, they determined that this speech was focused on a matter of personal grievance, more so than a matter of public concern. But, but that's different than what we have here. We're talking about uh, religion, freedom to, to worship, and, and, and things, of, things that affect the public, not, not necessarily a public grievance or a, a personal sure. grievance. Sure. Um, well, then, a f a even better case, uh, Snyder v. Phelps. It was decided by the Supreme Court in 2011, uh, the subject matter of which dealt with the Westboro Baptist, Ch uh, Westboro Baptist Church picketing. And in that case, the Supreme Court did sit state that matters touching on poli politics, religion, and other concern to the community, those are matters of public concern. However, the court said in that case also that that's only one side of the scales. We also have to look at the evidence on the record to determine whether the content, the context, and the, and the form of the speech would indicate that there's also matters of personal interest at stake. And that's what our argument is, Your Honor, that although it did touch indirectly on matters of public concern, there was also a lot, as, as Your Honor brought up um, previously, there were also, um, there's also uh, facts in the case that support a finding that Williams was speaking. Um, part of his speech was focused on a personal grievance with this boss, for example. When, when Chief Swanson was hired, uh, this particular our fire station, the Springfield Fire Department station, is in West Carolina, in the south. When Chief Swanson was hired, Williams complained that he came from up north, indicating some sort of prejudicial grounds against being prejudiced towards Chief Swanson. Additionally, he stated, Chief Swanson only got the job because he knew the mayor. If we also look at the unpublished note, he says, Swanson's no good for this station. Who does he think he is? Swanson only cares about himself. These are facts that, that support and buttress a finding that his speech also focused on a personal grievance. Thus, this, the Supreme Court case of, of Connick v. Myers is persuasive in this case because that case dealt with a mixed matter of a matter of public concern and speech that touched also on a matter of personal grievance. In that, in that case, the, the Supreme Court stated that because the speech um, was mixed, the state did not have to meet an overly onerous burden in justifying its termination of that employee, the Pickering, when they proceeded to the Pickering balancing test. And we would also encourage the court to so find that because it's a mixed question, the burden that the state has to meet is decreased. Additionally, we know that the, the speech, in, the burden that the state must meet in justifying termination of an employee for their speech varies uh, on the strength of that speech interest. And as we look at the factors stated by opposing counsel, we see that William's speech, or the Springfield Fire Department's interest in this case, is very weighty. This is not a tax collection agency. This is not a, a, some other um, public entity. This is the Springfield Fire Department in charge of fighting fires and saving lives, of which uh, um, a efficiency interest is very weighty. 
the first question that we must assess in the, in the Pickering balancing test is, did speech impair discipline to superiors? Opposing counsel state that there's no indication on the record that it did. However, there is abundant e evidence on the record that this speech impaired um, discipline to superiors. For example, Chief Swanson testified that after the notes were published, the men questioned everything. Excuse me, counsel. You, you do have the burden to prove that, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And, and is that a burden of going forward or the burden of proof? And what is the burden? Um, Your, Your Honor, we do, uh, we do carry the burden in proving actually all three of these elements, whether he was speaking as a citizen on a matter of public concern and whether our interest outweighs his interest in speaking. Um, and and because, because it's a mixed question, touching both on matters of public concern and um, matters of personal interest, the Supreme Court case of Connick D. Myers tells us the state does not have to meet an overly onerous burden in justifying the termination. Versus, for example, in, in Phelps v. Snyder, where the, where the Supreme Court, while the speech was abhorrent and, and speaking negatively about, uh, about a Marine's death at his funeral, the Supreme Court did state that in that case, because it was, the speech was focused at the heart, it was focused solely on a matter of public concern. The Westboro Baptist Church didn't care which Marine had been killed. Their message was that because of America's sinful practices, God was punishing the, the United States. So the Supreme Court stated that in that case, the speech was at the heart of the First Amendment. And thus, in order to stifle such speech, there would have to be a very weighty government interest. Whereas in this case, it's, it's very much distinguishable from Snyder v. Phelps, in that it is a mixed question. Additionally, Your Honors, we must consider whether the speech hindered harmony in close working relationships at the Springfield Fire Department. Chief Williams had been involved in a fistfight at this very station about religion. This is the very policy that Chief Swanson sought to just put a temporary ban on in while religion, religious tensions may have been high in the community and as uh, evidencing um, uh, indirect touching on matter of public concern. Um, this speech did nothing to foster, to somehow reconcile the, these hurt feelings, the problems and, and bad uh, feelings that were then existing in the Springfield Fire Department. Finally, we must ass assess whether the speech impeded the speaker's official duties. Again, opposing counsel states that there is little evidence on the record. And, and it is our burden, Your Honor, so here the, the following evidence is very persuasive. When Williams spoke as, this, as, the fire, as the communications liaison, as the mouthpiece of the fire department, his speech carried extreme significance. Because when people hear the communications liaison speaking, they think, that's the fire department speaking. We, we need to listen. If they say there's a fire up in the hills and we, and we need to get out of town, they listen because, because of who he is, because of the position he holds. The Supreme Court in Rankin stated that the burden of caution employees bear with respect to the words they speak will vary with the extent of authority and public accountability that employee's role entails. William's role entailed much um, official significance, and thus the state's burdens to strengthen. Further, in Garcetti, the Supreme Court stated, official communications have official consequences, creating a need for consistency and clarity. Supervisors must ensure that employees' official communications are accurate, demonstrate sound judgment, and promote the employer's mission. Thus, Your Honors, our case is, is that Williams was speaking pursuant to his official job duties. He was speaking as a communications liaison. And thus, under Garcetti v. Ceballos, his speech should not be protected by the fir First Amendment. And we ask you to reverse this, the district court on that point. However, if you find that his speech was as a citizen, we would ask you to, to um, look and see that his speech was only indirectly touching on matters of personal concern and was also saturated with, with personal grievance. Thus, the state does not have to meet an overly onerous burden in justifying its termination of Williams for his speech. And because the Pickering balancing factors weigh in favor of Williams in this case, and in, or, I apologize, in favor of the city's efficiency interest in this case, we would ask you to reverse on that point if you find that he's speaking as a citizen. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Any rebuttal? May it please the court, I'll deal with the Fourth Amendment issue and then the First Amendment issue. Thank you, Mr. Olin. Please proceed. Mr. Mullen's use of In Re Asia is very interesting, for In Re Asia didn't even use the factors of In Re Asia. In fact, they just listed those four. 
In Re Asia is a comparison of three district cases along with United States v. Simons and Glen Eyre, sorry, Muick versus Glen Eyre Electronics on one side of the equation compared with Leventhal v. Napec, U.S. v. Slanina, and Haynes versus the Attorney General of Kansas. That interesting Leventhal v. Napec, the five factors that our Fourth Amendment claim are based on, the fact pattern that exists today is similar to Leventhal v. Napec. And in that, the Tenth Circuit found that we have a legitimate expectation of privacy. Once I have a legitimate expectation of privacy, I have a Fourth Amendment violation based on the present fact pattern today. In addition, Mr. Mullen makes it seem as if we all need to be IT specialists before we can understand whether the RAM that's in play affects the use policy or the notice that were placed. Switching to the First Amendment. It's a very formulaic equation. Speech that touches upon matters of public concern. Content, form, context. Casey versus City of Kabul says that criticisms, no matter how obnoxious or offensive, of the employer and his policies touches upon matters of public concern. Once I've touched upon matters of public concern, I get to go to the Pickering Conic Balance Test. That's the end of that discussion. There are six factors. Those six factors, specifically the harmony in the workplace, the deterioration, were caused by the policies of the appellee, not by the Facebook notes. We respectfully pray that this court reverse the lower court's finding that there was no Fourth Amendment violation, that Mr. Williams did have a right, a reasonable expectation of privacy. We ask that this court affirm the district court's finding that Mr. Williams' First Amendment rights were violated. Please uphold the $10,000 damages award granted by the district court and the awarding of attorney's fees. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Rebuttal by the appellee. Your Honors, while opposing counsel attack our use of Asia Global, the test that they rely upon, Leventhal v. NAPAC, was on the public employee in that case. Speech and Fourth Amendment rights were protected, and the circuit court reversed on a motion to dismiss. Thus, the facts and the law were read in light most favorable to that public employee in that case. Thus, we would just ask Your Honors to take judicial notice of that point and affirm the district court's finding on the Fourth Amendment issue. As it pertains to the First Amendment, opposing counsel, as the district court did, ignores the first step as mandated by binding Supreme Court precedent Garcetti v. Ceballos and determine whether Williams is speaking on a matter of official, pursuant to his official duties. We urge this court to consider that factor and also to consider the other factors of the First Amendment analysis and reverse the district court on that point. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Mr. Mattson. Thank you for the presentations. We'll take a recess at this time. Could we have a round of applause from the audience? Thank you. Let me just first express our thanks and appreciation to the Moot Court Honors Board. They have done an outstanding job in designing a problem here and providing us with support for it and the writing, people in the writing program. Congratulations to those who have participated as advocates today. We are delighted to have them. And for all those who were forced to be here, we hope you had an enjoyable afternoon and that this will not be a loss to you. This is the time in the program where we have the opportunity to announce the winning team. And so it's my pleasure to recognize the team of William Grant Mullen and John Mattson as the champion team this year for the 2011 Creighton University Moot Court Conference. But that was not an easy choice, let me tell you. And finally then, it's my opportunity on behalf of those on the bench here to recognize the 
Outstanding Oralist for 2011 Creighton University Moot Court Competition. Uh, this year, the Outstanding Oralist is awarded to Mr. John Matson. No time has been allotted for speeches by the winners, so we'll move into the next part of the program. <laughs> uh, we've been invited to uh, make some comments and observations about the presentation today and about advocacy generally. And so what we're going to do is, uh, uh, based on uh, some of our discussion and our observations here, make some comments. And then we will uh, take the opportunity to open it to questions from the audience as well as the advocates. When we get to that point, please do not ask us how we made the decision. That's inappropriate. <laughs> Nobody ever gets to know. <laughs> Justice, would you like to start? Well, uh, let me say this, our comments, uh, uh, just sitting here listening to all of you, I had to suspend my sense of disbelief. I thought I was actually in Lincoln. Actually, we had oral arguments this morning, and let me tell you, this was much, much more stimulating than what I heard. <laughs> I, I, I was just, uh, I, I was so pleased uh, with, with the performances of all of you. So any comments we have, it's just, it, it's just suggestions and fly specking. I thought you did an out, outstanding job, really, uh, with a difficult, uh, difficult question. So uh, I, I, would, I would start off that uh, uh, I don't, this is just my personal opinion. I don't think you need to spend a lot of time thanking the court and being, hey, we're so this and that. You only, in real life, you only have about 10 minutes, at least in Nebraska, to, to make your case. So I, I would get, get right into it. Just uh, get right into it. I liked uh, one of the, uh, advocates uh, uh, conceding a point. Gosh, that was great to hear somebody concede a point because lawyers just will not concede anything. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a weak, it was a weak point and, and counsel, you knew that and, and so you conceded and moved on. I liked, the, I liked your forcefulness, uh, Mr. Rowland, how you got up and you got right, right with it and uh, uh, the jab was kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed you got the attention of your opposing counsel. Um, what else? Um, I, I liked uh, how, how one of you, and I can't remember, framed the issue for us right off the bat. You said, well, one, you got to find, uh, it was on the First Amendment, you have to one, find uh, whether it was a citizen or acting as a citizen. And then you went right down the line and, and kind of uh, framed it for us because uh, that's helpful because we had, to, uh, we had to review all this in such short time and it was very helpful. What else? Um, uh, it, it was a delight. I, I, this is the first time I've... I've been a judge for almost 20 years. This is the first time I think I've uh, uh, judged a uh, court. I'm, I'm very pleased, and, and, and I'm a Creighton grad, and I'm just gratified to come back and see that, boy, you're putting out outstanding students. And I'd hire any of you if I had, <laughs> if I had a vacancy. <laughs> I'll collect those resumes and screen them for uh, the judge. <laughs> Next, uh, Judge Ackerman. Thank you. I have to reiterate what he said. You did an absolutely fabulous job. I've stood on the other side of this a lot of times, and I think I learned a lot today, too, from watching you, or really you argued well. I think some of the better things to, is how you tie in the arguments to the law. You don't forget that you're still telling a story. 
uh, because, as he said, you're looking through this record, and I think I feel for the appellate judges even more because I came into this record about the last two days, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, wow, this fact here, I have to have all these tests in this law because this wasn't necessarily anything I was familiar with. So to the extent you were able to give us a road map, I'm going to cover this, this, and then you covered that and that. Uh, sometimes you have to be a little careful if you say you're going to do one, two, three things, or there's three cases, because sometimes you forget what the third case is. So you just, you just leave out the numbers from that angle. But to tell you, this is what I'm going to do, and then do it, helps frame the questions a lot. I thought you had great presence. An important thing is to take a presence. You're coming into this, and you want to take command of that podium, and you did that. And you had a good conversation back and forth with the court. We became, I mean, at times, as you said here, you started to get lost. You, you were really looking, and it was. It was like this was a real case, and we were really trying to decide this. So you did a good job on that. Good hand gestures. Many of you are starting to use hand gestures. That does break it up. And then also to the point that you're no longer tied to the notes, that you know the record, you know the cases so well that you can get up there and deliver without the notes. But you all did a great job. You really did. You, good work. Thanks. Thank you. A uh, couple of last comments just from where I sit. Uh, a great, great presentation by everyone. Uh, very effective, very well done. Uh, it's obvious there must be many great advocates in this room. Uh, just looking at the caliber of the four who end up here as finalists. A couple of observations. Um, one is uh, I ask a question once and the first words back to me were, uh, that's a fair question, Your Honor. I'm not sure if I intended it to be a fair question, <laughs> but it reminded me of an experience I had a few years ago. I was invited to speak at a small university and was addressing about 2,500 students and faculty. My wife was invited to introduce me. She's not one given to public speaking normally, but said she would do this assignment. She told a few stories about our family and kind of gave a flavor of who we are and what we do. And then she said, you're probably wondering what it's like to be married to a federal judge. <clears throat> she said, I'll tell you, this is a man who when he walks into the courtroom, everybody stands up. And when he sits down, everybody gets to sit down. And when he stands up to leave, everyone stands up. When he asks a question, the attorneys will say, Judge, that's a very good question. And the same kind of response was coming from the students as she was speaking. And then she said, when he makes a comment, the attorneys will say, Judge, that's a brilliant comment. <laughs> and then she leaned into the microphone and said, even if it's stupid. She said, when he comes home from this environment and being treated like that, I say, Bob, take out the garbage. <laughs> and then he's right back where he belongs. <laughs> so when a judge asks a question, you don't need to say whether it's fair or good. Just answer the question to the best of your ability. The, the presentations were very, very good, very detailed. Uh, obviously, you've lived with this for a period of time know that you will not always have a client who can afford to have you spend that much time in preparation. And so you'll have to figure out how to maximize it. If you're appearing in front of Justice Connolly, you'll have to figure out how to make it fit in 10 minutes total. Uh, the opportunities are great. This is a wonderful profession. Now, before we uh, open to questions, I neglected and should have taken a moment to recognize uh, in our audience, uh, is Kara Stockdale still here? Kara, please stand up. This is the author of the best brief in this year's competition. And runner up in the best brief is Kamal Patterson. Kamal. In law school, I had the unique opportunity to co-author, thanks to a very talented partner, The Best Brief. 
in a moot court competition. On the oral side of things, I didn't quite make it. But uh, let's hear from the audience. Are there questions, observations, comment? Uh, let's start with the board. Anything from the moot court honors board that you saw or want to comment about? That is the quietest moot court board <laughs> I've ever seen. All right, from the audience generally, any comments, questions? It's obvious that we've pressed you to the end of the hour. <laughs> um, who's in charge here? I suddenly feel like I'm losing the gavel. <laughs> I suppose that might be me. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, uh, at this point, we can all come upstairs for a reception and perhaps uh, with a little bit of refreshment, the questions will flow. <laughs> Wonderful idea. With that, we'll be in recess. Thank you so much.